Medical School. He's won a number of awards over the course of um, college and medical school and comes to us highly recommended from the OHSU faculty. He's done an excellent job on service here. I've gotten great feedback from a number of faculty about his performance over his various rotations through the service. Um, and he's going to speak to us today about one of his research projects. So welcome, Karan. Thank you, Dr. Morgan Cern, and um, thank you to all the residents and attendings for being welcoming and um, providing me with valuable teaching over these last three and a half weeks. Um, share my slides. So the uh, project that I want to talk to you all about today is a project that I've been working on since college and has fortunately followed me um, into med school, and that's looking at ion channels and the role that electrical activity plays in a subset of glioma cells, um, termed glioma uh, stem cells or stem-like cells. Um, the project, the genesis of the project really was um, at Journal Club when I was in the Ramirez lab at uh, Seattle Children's. And we looked at this paper from the Monhe lab in, at Stanford, um, where briefly they uh, optogenetically stimulated neurons and found that um, their electrical activity was closely linked to secretion of a molecule called neurolycan 3 and um, they uh, succinctly found that that neurolycan 3 could induce uh, glioma cell proliferation. And the question that um, came up to came to me and came to um, some of my lab members was the what role does electrical activity play in the communication between tumor cells um, and the surrounding neural environment? Um, and to me at the time, it, it would make sense that this would be an area to investigate considering CNS tumors are intimately interfaced with neurons and um, you know, electrical activity is the primary mechanism for inducing biological um, function in, that, in this organ system. So um, briefly, uh, glioma stem cells or glioma stem-like cells, um, they kind of fit into this cancer stem cell hypothesis, which posits that this um, subset of cells within um, gliomas and uh, cancers in general uh, might be responsible for the highly proliferative properties, um, invasive and uh, migratory properties of uh, cancers, uh, as well as um, may play a role into their uh, chemotherapeutic uh, resistance and difficulty to manage medically after, especially after resection. Um, and this is a figure I made uh, based on um, this paper by Ying et al. Uh, that establishes there are some uh, uh, there is some data to show that uh, cancer non CNS cancer cells are apologies about the fire alarm. Um, there are some. Uh, you want to close the door of the library so it's a little less loud. Oh, it's it's in the library. Oh, okay. Sorry. Well, it's okay. So there are other non-CNS cancer cells that are not hyperpolarized. So um, uh, we published this paper that um, looked at uh, the um, proliferation of ion channels uh, within glioma stem cells compared to um, their normal stem cell counterparts um, and normal human astrocytes. Um, interestingly, uh, ion channels that popped out, voltage-gated sodium channels, inward rectifying potassium channels, which were um, interesting to me because I uh, would think that these would be uniquely found in neurons and not really glioma stem cells. The figure on the left really just shows that um, in red, these are uh, ion channels that are uniquely expressed within these um, stem cell, glioma stem cell populations versus their normal human astrocyte counterparts. I wanted to take, uh, take it a step further because these are patient-derived stem cell lines. Um, I do have access to whether or not the, um, uh, they're EGFR, uh, EGFR positive um, and kind of cross-reference it to a cancer uh, pathway, like for example, the ras pi 3 k pathway. And you can see that um, p 2 Seven is a purine gated um, voltage ion channel, and KCNK10 is a uh, potassium leak channel, and they are uh, uniquely enriched in these EGRF positive um, uh, uh, samples um, compared to the EGRF negative. And then we did that for um, other cancer stem cell uh, pathways. So, naturally, the, the next question we want to ask is we have this heat map that shows us 
uh, different classes of ion channels that are uniquely expressed in the subset of glioma uh, cells. Um, what happens if you block them? Easy experiment for um, me, an easy question for me to ask. Um, and, you know, from voltage gated sodium channels to uh, voltage gated potassium channels and calcium channels, we have different uh, neurotoxins that can block them. And so the assay um, in C, the red and yellow are two glioma stem cell lines. The black is a control line. This assay is a high throughput assay where cells that proliferate reduce a certain molecule and produce a fluorescent signal. So the more fluorescent signal, the idea is you can um, presume that they are proliferating um, more rapidly and then the opposite is true. Uh, so interestingly, potassium depolarized the cell. Um, we saw a significantly um, increased uh, proliferative or in fluorescence intensity, assuming that uh, they are proliferating at a great, greater rate. Same thing with TTX and TEA blocking voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels, significantly decreased proliferative properties of those two cell lines. So uh, the, the main um, uh, experiment that I wanted to um, pursue, but it was difficult, was actually patch clamping onto these cells and looking at the electrical activity that they have. Um, patch clamping onto neurons is hard enough. Um, so it, while this is one figure, uh, this is the data I have so far. I patched onto five different cell lines and um, you know found that uh, while it's not a robust data set, um, around uh, you know, negative 35 uh, millivolts is uh, kind of the hyperpolarized state that I found these um, some of these GSC cell lines to be uh, uh, to be in. So going back to our heat map, we know that um, some of the uh, inward rectifying potassium channels, that's these GERP channels, um, they're G-coupled uh, protein inward, uh, G-coupled inward rectifying potassium channels. Um, and we found that they were highly enriched. So we uh, I wanted to focus in on those uh, channels. So what you're seeing here is just RNA sequencing and QT-PCR to um, confirm uh, the type of channel. So KCMJ9 and KCMJ5, which are GERP3 and 4. Uh, the two reds are two GSC cell lines where they were equally expressed. And then the blue cell lines are control cell lines that um, uh, did not express uh, uh, these channels highly. So those are our controls and the reds are experiments. So there is a blocker, ML2, or sorry, there's an activator, ML297, which activates these uh, GERP channels. So if you activate the channel, you hyperpolarize the cell in theory. If you block the channel, you depolarize the cell in theory. And so this is a dose response curve with the same fluorescence um, uh, proliferation assay that shows uh, a really nice response that if you hyperpolarize, in theory, if you're hyperpolarizing the cell, less proliferation if you're depolarizing the cell in theory, um, uh, more, proliferative, more proliferation in these cell lines. And to confirm that, there's an immunohistochemical uh, experiment. Uh, EDU labels all proliferating cells. DAPD is just to control that uh, labels all nucleated cells, and you can quantify that. And uh, it follows well with the uh, data suggested in the um, MTT assay. So, um, uh, you can also develop siRNAs and try and knock down these channels and see what happens. So if you knock down GERP3 and 4 um, using that same assay, I found that they, um, it did affect uh, GSC viability. Um, to get more resolution though, so EDU uh, again labels all proliferative cells. There is an assay that uses uh, a FUCHI sensor, which gives you more resolution and tells you where the cells are in the cell cycle. Um, specifically, uh, it can tell you, uh, it can delineate between the G1 phase and the SG2M phase. So um, this nicely correlates with um, what we were seeing. So if, uh, if you um, dose the cells with uh, ML297, um, so if you activate the channels, they're presumably in a hyperpolarized state. Um, and this is just an N of three. So not, again, not robust data, but um, we stain them and we found that um, you know, more, more cells were, um, when, they, when these GERP channels were activated, were in this G1 phase. Um, if you were to block the channel, it um, correlated well with the no treatment group. Um, and then this is a kind of figure I made that establishes the role of um, 
membrane uh, potentials and um, their role in cell cycle progression. And a lot of this work was um, established by Dr. Cohn in the 70s. So um, that kind of nicely illustrates where in this cell cycle, uh, different uh, membrane states occur. So, um, you know, in summary, uh, these are, you know, general kind of conclusions, not a lot of robust data to support it, but um, RNA sequencing expression shows significantly increased enrichment of certain ion channel subtypes in patient-derived GSCs. Membrane potential for some of these GSCs may suggest uh, that they live at a hyperpolarized state. Um, maybe these inward rectifying, that's a typo, inward rectifying potassium channels um, play a role in establishing the hyperpolarized state, and maybe they play a role in progressing them through the cell cycle. So I wanted to um, thank um, Nino Ramirez at Seattle Children's, uh, Bob Ristamoli, who's now at Houston Methodist, and the Paul Bram Lab at uh, Vollum Institute, as well as the Mary Gates Endowment for a lot of the funding for this project. Uh, these are my references um, and, and questions. Ron, this is really well done. And I also want to say that um, you handled the distraction of a fire alarm through the middle of your presentation very nicely. So I'm really, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, that's 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 not you, but but nicely done. The um, it, what what do you see as next steps for this project yeah, in yeah, terms so of handling and you know, take taking this information and translating yeah. it further? Um, really, uh, some experience I really want to do is um, so this idea that. Um, I, I knocked around with uh, Dr. Ramirez is that there are, there's a method where you can um, slice um, uh, mouse, uh, uh, you can take mouse brain slices and it's called organotypic slice culturing. Um, and you can culture them for about like a couple weeks, keep them alive. And um, you can culture the stem cells on top of them. And there are like micro electrode arrays that you can um, put on top of it and then record. So hopefully, you know, the idea would be record from the stem cells as well as the neural environment, add some of these um, blockers and activators, you know, see how the electrical properties change. Um, of course, I want more um, electrical record or patch clamp recordings from these GSCs and see what happens when you add like ML297, a group channel activator or um, blocker and see how that changes. So those are kind of like uh, next steps that I want to pursue. Do you have a thought about how this could make its way into any future clinical decision-making or, or development? Yeah. I, you know, when I was like in college, I, I thought, wow, this is cool. Like maybe this is a, a therapeutic avenue, but I, I don't, um, you know, it's hard for me to think of this maybe as a, a potential um, therapeutic avenue, but more so maybe understanding a little bit more about the qualities um, that make uh, gliomas um, difficult to manage medically um you know like i was saying it uh to me it would it seems um uh, it seems like a, a good thought to think that uh electrical activity from neurons might be um in like the surrounding tumor micro environment might be influencing uh some of the uh tumorigenic behavior of, of these uh of this subpopulation of cells so i think it might just give a little bit more understanding about how the pathogenesis of these tumors rather than a therapeutic paradigm. Karan, nice job. This is Kostas Hadjapanaya. So one of the things we've learned with stem cells, glioma stem cells is, as you mentioned, they're resistant to radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, and that was kind of the hallmark showing us that, it, you know, if you could try to get to these cells that may help treat the rest of the tumor that hasn't quite panned out well, but, you know, I think, some experiments that you may want to, you might want to incorporate are looking at some of the RT experiments with the glioma stem cells, and then see if you can inhibit the ion channels, um, and really kind of show that 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 could target them better, because they do survive radiation and chemotherapy, and and they even have pumps that pump out chemotherapy drugs that have been shown. Uh, so that may be something you might want to consider. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great thought, definitely. Hey, it's Alex. Nice job. Really enjoyed the presentation. Just had a quick question about hey. with the hyperpolarization. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you seen, I know you looked at several receptors, yeah. and obviously one of the issues with glioblastoma is the heterogeneity of the tumor microenvironment. Yeah. When you yeah. looked at EGFR and some of these other receptors, did you see that they had any differences? You may not have looked at this, but in terms of hyperpolarization, 
there's any link between actual tumor cell proliferation and a hyperpolarized state. Did you notice that in any of these different receptor expression profiles um, that you saw any type of link? Um, not that, so I guess, I guess the answer is uh, I haven't fully looked at that, but uh, that is something that was brought up in a lot of uh, lab meetings to try and like um, elucidate that, that thought out too. So that I guess that would be another direction to kind of uh, investigate further. Ron, really nice, uh, really nice talk. I enjoyed it. Could you just go back to your slide, looking at the pharmacological uh, yeah. treatments that you did? Yes. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Yeah. So my question here, mm -hmm. uh, looking at this, is if you're looking at the fluorescence intensity as a marker for proliferation, mm -hmm. and you're using some of these pharmacological treatments, can you speak to, you know, the susceptibility of uh, these? Uh, GSE lines to be influenced by these treatments? I mean, because it looks to me that you have a control here that is more proliferative uh, in certain area, you know, certain treatments yeah. based off of the intensity. So you're, even at lower intensities, the, the tumor cell lines are not as proliferative. And then when you treat them for everything except, you know, potassium, it looks like, or maybe even your picrotoxin, that, that you're not... Um, that it's not actually, you know, affecting the proliferation. So, I mean, is it that these, mm -hmm. these cell lines are not as susceptible to these treatments, but even then you would expect that they might, if they are, uh, that they would become more like your control theoretically. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that's, that's really good. That's a really good point. I think the, the assay itself has, um, uh, some, some, uh, flaws within it, or at least like, uh, uh, I should be more careful with um, the conclusions I, I uh, make from this assay because it, it isn't really um, uh, like a one-to-one -one relationship with proliferation. So the, the MTT is like some metabolite that assuming that the cells are proliferating, they're taking up and they're, it gets reduced and it creates a fluorescent signal. So um, I think that's why uh, I wanted to kind of broaden that out and do more immunohistochemical um, stains of these experiments to see if they're at, like if they are incorporating EDU or um, some of the other um, proliferation uh, antibodies, fluorescent antibodies, maybe that can help confirm um, some it of may, the findings. It could be interesting yeah. in the sense that, yeah. you know, that if, if the, the tumor cell lines, you know, have less of an ability to respond or are less responsive to yeah. some treatments. I don't know if it works for the proliferation story, but yeah. You know, that's certainly something that could could be you know looked at in terms of uh, yeah. why these these cell lines might be less affected than your other ones. Yeah. Nice, nice work. Well, Karan, thank you again. We've enjoyed having you on service and we look forward to seeing you back at interview time.